So FedCap is hosting this solution series because no family, no family is immune from the ravages of mental illness and addiction, only made worse by the discrimination that is felt by so many people. We certainly honor Congressman Kennedy's courage to share his story and by telling his story, represent the voices of thousands and thousands of people across the country and to identify policy and funding shifts to make real improvements in early identification and treatment and recovery. FedCap is privileged to join with so many leaders, with Congressman Kennedy, with the First Lady of the City of New York, Shalane McRae, <laughs> and so many others across the country to make high quality mental health and addiction services accessible to all of those who need them, when they need them, and where they need them. That is what the Solution Series is all about, to identify key opportunities to change the story, to change the narrative, and then utilize informed, laser-focused interventions in order to make a difference. This event has received a tremendous response, so much so that it is being streamed across the country and even across the pond in England. Thanks to Linda Paquette and our colleagues at New Futures, an organization that has spearheaded significant policy and practice strides, 150 people are currently listening and watching to this, this presentation in Concord, New Hampshire. There are also listening events being held in Washington, D.C., Boston, Massachusetts, New Jersey, at Easter Seals in upstate New York, and at the Substance Use and Mental Health Leadership Council in Rhode Island. But moments like today just don't happen. They're the result of the drive and the energy and the commitment of our CEO and President Christine McMahon. <laughs> Christine never stops in her commitment and her energy striving to make us all better. And she has the courage to actually endorse a bold future for all of us, for all individuals with barriers. And she truly believes in the power of possible. They are also the result of the planning and attention to detail of Lori Lutz, our Chief Strategy Officer, who will be facilitating this discussion this afternoon. Finally, they are the result of the leadership of our Board Chair, Mark O'Donohue. Mark's intelligent, inspired guidance is unparalleled in the field of nonprofit organizations. We had the pleasure of having Mark address us yesterday at a leadership forum and his comments were wonderful. Mark? Uh, first, I want to, uh, on behalf of the board of uh, directors of FedCap, welcome all of you who are here today to participate in this, in this event in person or by video. I want to thank the law firm of McDermott, Will & Emery, which is hosting us here today, and in particular its chairman, Peter Sacra uh, Sacraponte. I've been looking forward to this event for a couple of days now because, as I told the congressman, I've been reading his book. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about about it today, but I'm going to put in a plug for the book. It is a great book. It's really fantastic in terms of policy, and it's, fa it's a fantastic recounting of his life story in a way that's moving, direct, and very powerful. It's very well done, so buy the book. Um, <laughs> we have... <laughs> I checked Amazon. He gets five stars. <laughs> we have well, enough... I need to write that check to you, <laughs> We have a number of distinguished guests uh, who are joining us today to hear this conversation with uh, the congressman. If I may mention just a few, they include HRA Commissioner Steve Banks, <laughs> and of course, Mayor David Dinkins. Uh, Mayor Dinkins has been 
a familiar figure at a number of FedCAP events and has been a great supporter of the organization. Uh, he's known for many achievements. I, I think we should note that the municipal building has been named after him now in recognition of his contribution. <laughs> but the presence of Shirlene McRae, the First Lady of New York City, reminds us that his administration was an early form of Match.com <laughs> because it was responsible for giving her now husband, Mayor de Blasio, the opportunity to meet and woo her. <laughs> so kudos to you, Mayor Dinkins. <laughs> As chair of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, Shirlane McRae has been a driving force behind important initiatives to deliver mental health services to low-income and at-risk populations. She, as she said the other day in one of her tweets, if you have your health, you have everything. And there is no health without mental health. So she has made it her business to forge public-private partnerships to deliver services to people who need that assistance because of the needs of their mental health. We're grateful, very grateful, that she's joined us today to introduce Patrick Kennedy for this conversation which will change the way we think and talk about mental health and addiction issues. Please welcome Shirlane McRae, the First Lady of New York City. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Mark. FedCap is lucky to have a, a powerhouse like you leading the board. <laughs> Whoa, what a long road this has been. We've come so far, but we're just getting started, right? You know, New York City is so lucky to have an organization like FedCap fighting on behalf of our neighbors who face barriers to employment. And I I'm, I'm count myself fortunate because I had the opportunity to see for myself how FedCap is changing lives when I visited the We Care site in downtown Brooklyn back in April. Now, We Care helps people with all kinds of health challenges, helps them find jobs and get their lives back on track. And I commend Steve Banks, our Commissioner of Human Resources, uh, Commissioner of the Human Resource Administration, for his stewardship of this program. And I commend everyone here who is involved with the program. While I was at FedCat's we Care site, I talked with a man by the name of Timmy. And our conversation was so inspiring. Timmy came to We Care with a history of substance abuse and, and, and little faith that he would ever find a job and build what he called a real life. But with help from FedCap, Timmy was able to achieve both. He's been working for almost a year now and is currently a maintenance specialist at a building services company. Just as important, his faith in himself has been restored. Connecting people who have had experiences like Timmy's to the treatment and support they need ultimately benefits us all. And why? Well, I like to say is because we all do better when we all do better. <laughs> at any given time, one in five adult New Yorkers is dealing with a mental illness. And if we are talking about the heart, or gallbladder, or any other part of the body, we'd, we'd be up in arms, right? We'd say it's an epidemic. That statistic, one in five adults, means that nearly every individual has been touched. That means every family, every classroom, and every workplace. It means that we need to address this challenge like the public health crisis that it is. And it means that when FedCap helps someone like Timmy succeed, to have a life with meaning, a life with purpose, a life that is productive, that means our city grows a little stronger. Now, the de Blasio administration is committed to creating many more of those success stories. Bill and I are motivated by our personal experiences with mental health and especially by our daughter's experience who's She's currently in recovery from addiction, anxiety, and, and substance abuse, and she, she's doing well, but she's 
inspired us greatly as she's um, been on this journey to recovery. Since Bill took office, the administration has committed approximately $350 million in additional mental health funding over the next three years. But that is just a beginning. What we need, what we desperately need, is a plan of action, a citywide plan of action. And that's why we're developing a roadmap for mental health. The roadmap, which we will release in, in just a few weeks, the roadmap will guide us. It will include programs based on the feedback from experts and from everyday New Yorkers from all across the city, while also laying out a long-term plan for change. Despite being the greatest city in the world, I know I'm biased, but <laughs> New York is, a, is, is the greatest city in the world, we cannot solve the mental health crisis. It's bigger than we are, and we need big voices. We need a movement to bring about the culture change and the policies that will save lives. Which brings me to the man I am honored to introduce today. Now, when you look up Patrick Kennedy on Wikipedia, the first few sentences of his bio are about how he served Congress for 16 years and how he's the son of uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. But those of us who care deeply about mental health know him as one of our, our most vocal one of our most effective and compelling advocates. No fair-minded person would have faulted Patrick if he stayed quiet about his struggles with bipolar disorder and addiction. He grew up around people who were, as he describes them, geniuses at not talking about things. But Patrick also grew up around some of the greatest leaders our nation has known, and he clearly absorbed those lessons as well. After very publicly breaking what he calls the conspiracy of silence around his, tr his own troubles, he led the charge to pass the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which protects the rights of those who struggle with mental illness. Today, he is the leader of the Kennedy Forum, which is working to change the way mental health and addiction are treated in our healthcare system. He is also, as we've met, just mentioned, the newly published author of A Common Struggle, a very personal journey through the past and future of mental illness and addiction. And I am also reading the book, I tell you, it's compelling, it's a compelling and powerful narrative. Thanks to Patrick's work, this common struggle is getting much more attention every day. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Patrick Kennedy. <laughs> Congressman, I want to join the voices in saying welcome. It's an honor. I read your book cover to cover and um, took lots of notes and found it to be this marvelous tapestry of your personal story, a research document, and a policy discussion. And I actually would like to weave my conversation with you in a similar way. I'd like to start in 1963, um, shortly before President Kennedy was assassinated, he actually signed into law the Community Mental Health Act. And that was to establish a network of community health centers around the country. The goal was to ensure that I could go, live in a community and get access to quality care. And yet, as we know, the deinstitutionalization resulted in people being homeless, people living in poverty. I have two questions. Why do you think President Kennedy's vision wasn't fulfilled? And actually, even more important, given all that our First Lady was talking about and all that you see happening around the country, how can we not make similar mistakes? Well, thank you, Laurie. And uh, I'd like to thank the First Lady for her generous introduction and wish her and the mayor and your family the best. Um, what you're doing here in New York is a model for the country. I know that the roadmaps coming out shortly, but just your personal commitment to this and the, 
that of your husband is just fantastic and, uh, and sorely needed. There's a vacuum of leadership in this country. There is no roadmap for this nation on the single greatest public health crisis that we have as a nation. And I appreciate all of you who are New Yorkers should appreciate that your administration is leading the way on that. And I, uh, it, now that I'm a South Jersey resident, <clears throat> I'm happy to come up here anytime you need me uh, because I want to tell everybody that what you're doing is great needs to be commended. And, and to all of you who are part of FedCap, uh, thank you so much for really doing what is so essential and missing in this whole space, and that is employment. Uh, we think of this as a medical issue, as a human services issue, and so forth, but we often miss what is often most important to the people in recovery, and that's the opportunity to have the same self-esteem that, as we know in our culture, comes from what you do for a living and the fact that you are employed. And so, and to, to Mayor Dinkins, who, who started much of this and, and worked so hard for social justice, uh, this is the new frontier of social justice, and I thank you for being here as well. Uh, now, I've just ignored Lori's question. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so great. But, <laughs> but you know, President Kennedy was really responding to uh, his sister, my aunt uh, Eunice, who was on him to make sure that their family experience with my aunt Rosemary um, was never visited upon any other family. And uh, the shame and silence around uh, the struggles of my Aunt Rosemary was something that all members of my father's generation had to keep secret. But something powerful came from that. And it ultimately became the Special Olympics. And uh, everybody acknowledges that Rosemary was kind of the inspiration for Eunice uh, and my family starting the Special Olympics and what a powerful symbol of celebrating people's strengths and their humanity and involving the family members of those struggling with developmental disabilities and mental illnesses. So, you know, this 1963 Community Mental Health Act was really intended to celebrate people's ability to be independent, like FedCap tries to do in all of the programs you just saw. Uh, a comprehensive approach to keeping people living with their families in their communities. What a novel concept. Yeah. You're trying to do it now, and you continue to do it. So, but what was missing were the resources. So, you know, the First Lady and I were talking before this, the roadmap is key to providing the continuity of resources to fulfill the mission. See, what ended up happening is those resources that were supposed to follow people from institutions into the community never ended up following them. So what happened? We reinstitutionalized people. We took them out of the asylum, so to speak, and put them in the new asylums. And those are our jails and our prisons. That is the tragic story. But I will say, John F. Kennedy got it right in what he was trying to do. And really what he was trying to do is what FedCap does on a daily basis. Thanks, Patrick. So, Congressman, one of the things that you just said was that employment was absolutely critical. And as you could tell, we're pretty focused on employment, as you said. It's interesting, according to the National Alliance for Mental Illness, the unemployment rate for the mentally ill is between 65 and 80 percent. What do you think are the causes of this continued unemployment, and are there systemic or policy barriers that we can impact? Well, what a setup that was. <laughs> so, of course, the, uh, the dollars go to services as opposed to outcomes, and so it's hard for us to get people into supportive environments where they can work and enjoy, you know, as independent a lives as they, that they can. If the dollars only go to keeping them in the program. So what we need to do is what you're trying to do with the waiver here and Medicaid, and that's broaden the dollars to incorporate the other things that are going to help pe keep people 
from needing medical care through providing them the social services and housing services that will keep them out of the emergency rooms and are out of our institutions. So it's just about you know, creativity and unfortunately programmatically we don't allow for that creativity. Um, so that's what we need to allow people like you who know what they're doing to be able to do it. And I love when you talk about the money following the client. That's not a not a new concept and yet you're, you're zeroing in on the fact that if an individual with a mental illness is supported in achieving stability and then woven into that clinical milieu is workforce readiness, which I think is part of what you were saying, then an individual comes out on the other side of treatment with a chance at establishing some form of a self-sufficient life, yeah. And you know, the fountain houses and the new recovery centers, uh, my uh, senator from Rhode Island, <laughs> Sheldon Whitehouse, has got the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery yeah. Act. The notion of building the kind of fountain house model for people in recovery from addiction is terrific. Yeah. These are all low cost, high return investments. Um, so I, I know that they're, they're what you support and I support them as well. Thank you, Congressman. You know, it's, as you already discussed, it's pretty well known that your Aunt Rosemary had a developmental disability. What I thought was interesting in your book, and what I don't think I understood, is that she was one of 33% of individuals with developmental disabilities in this country who had a co-occurring mental illness. And when you think about it, the origin of mental illness is some form of chemical imbalance in the brain, and that a brain that's already damaged might be susceptible to some form of biological or chemi chemical imbalance. I was intrigued by the idea that the professionals, and I did a lot of research, and you and I talked that there's not a lot of research, that the professionals that are out there may not understand the frequency in which this co-occurrence occurs. And um, one of the things that's happening around the country is there is this movement to have individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities go to work and work side by side, people without any kind of disability. And yet I'm very concerned that we're missing this critical piece. And I wonder if you could talk about how we can raise the bar, shine the spotlight, and actually increase the level of proficiency in this issue. Well, you know, it's treating a whole person, whether they're in the IDD box, the SUD box or the SMI box because that's how the money flows. You either have to have a mental illness or you have to have a substance use disorder or you have to have an intellectual disability. God forbid you have a little bit of a both, you know. Then the system doesn't know what to do with you and that's what, what happens is you fall through the cracks. Well, they're not my job, you know, I'm IDD over here. Or no, I'm SMI, you're over on the IDD. I mean, literally it's that bad. Still, still. So the key to all this is treating the whole person. And whatever their needs are, meeting those needs because it's gonna save them a lot of suffering and by the way, it's gonna save the system a lot of money because you know we're not spending money in ways that don't help that person and therefore don't get any kind of return in their lives. Have you considered any kind of legislation or any kind of economic model that might do a better job of that kind of integration? So I've always believed that the uh, insurance industry, um, if their liabilities are aligned correct correctly and their incentives are aligned correctly, will do the right thing. And so that's why I've been on the fact that we need to implement the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act because right now, insurance companies are regularly violating that law. And ironically, they're doing so at their peril, not because they're gonna get sued, and by the way, thank God for your attorney general here, who's the only attorney general in the nation that's actually filing any parity violation lawsuits. Let's give him a round. I know he's not here, but. <laughs> but we all know, and this room's filled with people in business, that the secret sauce of health care reform is managing the underlying anxiety, depression, mental illness of people in the workplace and in health insurance plans who are being neglected because of the shame and stigma around having that diagnosis. So guess what? No one goes 
diagnosed, but meanwhile they're racking up their emergency room visits. They're non-compliant with their diabetes or their cardiovascular disease. They suffer more than they need to with respect to cancer, all because we're ignoring, you know, the mind. We're ignoring the brain. And so, you know, this is going to save us money on the physical health side. Everyone says, well, you're going to spend more money on the mental health side. Absolutely. We need to spend a lot more money on the mental health side. But we're going to get it paid for by the reduction in comorbidities in all the physical health. And because mental health has always been carved out, none of the gurus in economics have seen the savings in providing mental health because to them, they're just looking at the, the additional costs and not the overall savings to the person within their health plan. So I think we need to put the liability on insurance companies, manage their non-quantitative treatment limit implementation. That's the fancy word for utilization management, how they deny care. But then come up there with Goldman Sachs and PwC and American Express and show them that, hey, guess what? This saves dollars. So you can do the right thing and make money at the same time. I think the, found the comment that I read in your book is ensure that every primary care doc does a checkup from the neck, neck up. up. Yeah, what a concept that, that a you concept. go to a physician's office and they take your blood pressure and monitor your cholesterol and maybe they should you know, do, do an ACE score if, if you're a kid. And I love the fact that you're trying to begin to implement that because that has payoffs not only in our healthcare system but in our education system. And the biggest payoff is that it allows you to divert people from ending up in the criminal justice system because they're acting out on childhood traumas that were never properly identified early on when, when intervention could have made the biggest difference. Thank you. Congressman, in your book, um, and I'm going to quote you because um, it, it caused me to sit back and think about it. You said, working backward from suicide is a way of being inclusive to all mental health and addiction care. And I have thought about the fact that 22 veterans complete suicide every single day in this country, and there's 80,000 annual attempts at suicide by our adolescents. What did you mean by that comment? Well, let me get into what I want to say. <laughs> and that is, you know, you in New York have done a great job at the hiring of vet. You know, you've had all these great celebrated events. We are hire vets, hire vets. Walmart's hiring 100,000. Starbucks is hiring. JP Morgan is hiring. But has anyone talked about making sure that your employer sponsored health care plan has sufficient? Network adequacy. Now you all understand what that means here because you know as HR directors that your employees are trying to go out there get appointments for themselves and their family members and they're waiting five months to get an initial appointment. That's not network adequacy. In fact, that's a violation of the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So why do we need to do this with more urgency than ever before? Because of our patriots because it's not only the VA that's going to be left on the hook for, for disregarding the signature wounds of war, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. It's going to be United, Anthem, Cigna, Aetna, Humana, all of them are going to now be on the hook because, and you are too, as corporations who contract with a third-party administrator, because if your employees, who you may not know, may be a one, two, three tour of duty Iraq, Afghan war veteran, and they have this epidemic of suicide because they aren't able to get the proper support services they need for their signature wound of the war, that is going to change culture really quickly. Because if you're Fred Smith out of FedEx, and something happens with one of your drivers, and no one realized they tried to get services and couldn't, Believe me, there's a culture change. And I'm begging you now, for those of you who can go back to your C-suite and tell your bosses and others, we need to do something now on this because I'd hate to have to learn this lesson 
after uh, more public tragedies because of the suicide rate is not tragically going away until we get in there early and really work to prevent it, which of course we won't be able to do if the services aren't paid for because you don't purchase good health plans that cover these services as an integral part of the provision of care. Thank you, thank you. You know, as you listed in the back of your book, just a series of incredible recommendations. One of them, most of them um, struck me um, right to the bone, but this one really was pretty impressive. You said that every single county in this country should be diverting individuals with serious mental illness away from our jails and our prisons and into community-based treatment. And I, I would love to know some, thought, some of your thoughts around how we might structure that, but you also mentioned a Miami-Dade criminal mental health project, and you called it a profound replicable model. Could you talk about what was noteworthy around that? So in there, uh, you had a, a judge, uh, Stephen Leifman, who recognized that most of the court docket was made up of people with untreated mental illness and addiction. You know, no surprise. But what is a surprise is he did something about it. As opposed to them building more jail space, he said, what if we floated a bond to be able to build more supportive housing and, and hire more case managers for the very people that I'm going to see in my courtroom every year because the recidivism rate amongst people with untreated mental illness and addiction is surpasses 80 percent. And guess what happened? They floated the bond, they, they fronted the money to provide the services, and guess what? The recidivism rate dropped dramatically, meaning they didn't have to construct a new hundred million dollar prison and what they ended up doing is rerouting those dollars to build even more community support services. What a concept that you can invest differently if you look anew at the way our budgets are constructed. And so the key to all this are these social innovation bonds. Um, I ultimately think if we could change the paradigm of our whole structure so everything was siloed, housing, labor, transportation, human services, Medicare, Medicaid, SSDI, if we could ever figure out, and why can't we get some smarty pants people to come in there with the calculator and pen, and reorganize those dollars to get a much better benefit for the individual and for society at a time where we're going to be awash in red ink if we continue to pay for all these things in the way we've historically paid for them, which is going to bankrupt us because there's not enough people um, who can get the services and the dollars that we are spending, we're not spending in the most cost-effective way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I just have one more question, and then I know that the audience members are undoubtedly chomping at the bit. So you mentioned the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act that you sponsored, fought hard for, and won. What a legacy that is, huh? That must feel good. Well, I wish I could say that the bill passed because we all rose up one day and said, wouldn't it be great to treat the brain like every other organ of the body? But that's not the way it happened. It happened because whenever I needed a bill passed, I called my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I called my dad. He was home convalescing from brain surgery. And he said, you know, Chris, is, Chris Dodd's handling my work on the uh, labor pensions and health committee, you know, talk to him. Well, I talked to Chris. Now, then what happened? As you all recall, in 2008, we had a little bit of a bump in our economy and our banking system was near collapse. All of a sudden, Chris became a very, you know, noticeable guy because as chairman of the banking committee, he was in charge of ushering through the toxic asset relief program. Not a very popular bill, but one that was essential to save the economy. So Chris called me back and he said, Patrick, in the wake of this you know, tragic circumstance in our economy, I have a way of passing your bill, H.R. 1424, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. I said, what is it, Chris? Give it to me. He said, how about I write the $700 billion toxic asset relief program 
into your HR 1424, <laughs> thereby guaranteeing its passage. So my friends uh, from Wall Street and banking and finance, I'm the guy <laughs> that bailed you all out. <laughs> It's an incredible bill, and not yet fully implemented, but well, on its no way. no one knew we passed it. That's the problem. <laughs> That's right. It's kind of overshadowed. When it is fully implemented, one of the things that we talked about is there's still a bifurcation in treatment between mental health and addiction. And, and you talk about treating the whole person, and yet there are systemic and, and to some extent, legal barriers um, to do that. Can you talk about how we might break through those barriers? Well, I think that covering mental illness and addiction as the physical illnesses they are requires that we make some changes to some historic discriminatory statutes. So in 64, we wrote this uh, Civil Rights Act. Then we need to do the Voting Rights Act. Then the Fair Housing, Fair Employment, so forth. In mental health, we're just starting our new foray into changing the whole historic system. So parity sets us up. But we need to do some other things to ensure that these are treated like equal diseases to all other diseases. And that means you cannot tell someone who's in recovery from addiction that they're not going to benefit from coordinated care because their records are going to be separate and unequal to the records of someone getting and benefiting from coordinated care for kidney and heart disease and cancer. So this means taking on stigma, because stigma says keep it a secret. Don't talk about it, and guess what? Don't even reimburse it the same way as the rest of medicine. And my friends, until we break that silence, this medical taboo, which is you know, the brain illness, is, not, is treated as a character flaw, not a chemistry issue. Until we break that thing, we're still going to relegate people who suffer from brain illness to substandard, second-class treatment from our medical system. You know, what's important, um, I think, for all of us to know is that when you and Woonsocket kind of came out, I think that was your language, um, and really talked about your depression and your, and your addictions, uh, not only did that um, create a, a positive, almost a almost got a big hug from the state of Rhode Island, it seemed like. But in they gave me a lot of hugs. They did give you a lot of <laughs> hugs. But and to my friends in Rhode Island who see me now, hey, Rhode, go Rhode. What also happened is that as a result of your courage, proportionately, Rhode Island has a greater percentage of individuals um, seeking treatment. And our, our colleague Craig talks about that a lot, that you had the courage to stand up and people are saying, I, can, I need it access to, and I'm going to go seek for what I want. So the numbers of legacies that you have are, are multiple, and thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I was blessed that the people of Rhode Island, because it's so small, everybody knows each other, and I had n a number of years to get to know them before I disclosed anything. So they started to know me before I gave them something that could have easily been knocked me out in terms of what their image of me was. Um, they repeatedly supported me, and, be, and it was, in fact, after I was arrested for a DUI, and my, I thought my political career was over, that Rhode Island reelected me in the biggest plurality mm -hmm. of my whole congressional career, because at that point I made my sponsorship of parity my number one campaign issue, and uh, it just transcended politics. I, I never forget being at the polling places on election day and people coming up to me and saying, Kennedy, I never voted for you. And I just can't imagine ca kind of casting a vote for your family. And then, but I'm going to do it in this election. Wow. Because, you know, my mother, my father, my son or daughter is suffering and it's, it's awful. And I think Congress deserves to have someone there fighting for these issues. And, you know, it's a. <coughs> you bet. You bet. So, questions from the audience and from our streaming folks from around the country. Please. I'm a psychiatrist in New York City, so I see much of what you 
talk about. I read your book. I can't thank you enough for what you've done, really. Um, what can my patients do when they are constantly rejected from their insurance company? How can they, patients all over the country, band together to sort of work Excellent. on this issue? So, um, so we don't have a right of action under the ACA. You know, we can at best get our treatment paid for that should have been provided earlier. But that's too long and arduous for a consumer to be able to do. I love the fact that uh, you here in New York, a psychiatrist, represented your patients in a class action lawsuit and were initially dismissed because it was said that, well, it plaintiff has to be the person who's got the grievance. Thank God that the court acknowledged your standing. That was big. Um, but the other big thing was that the court acknowledged that um, employers and especially insurers have a fiduciary responsibility. That, I think, is going to make a big difference because now, as we know, we're in a law firm, right? We operate in society based upon a lot of liability and what it forces us to do that we wouldn't otherwise do. We need a little liability to get people moving in this space. Finally, politically, we need to ha facilitate greater expression and public support for a mental health agenda. And, and our support politically have been, has been anemic. One of the reasons we don't have real leadership is that there's no one out there, you know, going to the Hill, knocking on con congressional desk doors and saying we need help. So that needs to, we need to figure out a way to empower people politically. Um, so uh, I have uh, worked with the Parity Implementation Coalition to have a parity app. So it's, we need to, it's, it's 1.0. 1, 1 we need to make it 4.0. So support to build out a parity app, which would basically define what your denial letter says what your diagnosis is, what you need, and how to file that appeal in the way that gets you the best reversal of decision. One, we need to also track parity implementation across the country. On the Kennedy Forum website, we have the parity tracker. So that's, again, 1.0, but it gives people a sense of where their state ranks amongst other states in doing some basic things that would help uh, people in that state to uh, uh, get justice under the parity law. So those are a few uh, ideas. I actually have a follow-up to that from New Hampshire. Um, Senator Kelly Ayotte um, from New Hampshire as a Republican has recently put out a statement that she was going to study um, why the parity law um, was not being enforced. And the question is, do we need a study? What we need, this is really big, if Senator Aya can do this, this would be terrific, is, you know, let's get the Republicans to call Secretary Burwell to the Hill. They should love this. They love torturing the Obama administration. This is, should be old hat for them on, on health care, nonetheless. And tell them, go at it. You know, torture Sylvia Burwell on the fact that she has not enforced the Mental Health Parity Act by requiring disclosure by insurance companies of how they apply their criteria for medical utilization review. You can't do parity unless you can compare utilization management practices across the behavioral health, med, and surge. Inpatient in-network, outpatient in-network. Inpatient out-of-network, outpatient out-of-network. Pharmacy and ER. We were clear, if you provide primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care in any of those buckets to the cancer patient, cardiovascular disease patient, and the like, and you're not doing it for the behavioral health patient, you're in violation of the law. We can't measure that until Secretary Burwell requires insurance companies to submit not only their criteria, but how that criteria is applied across their system, which can be done. Okay, they can get the you know, IBM, get the algorithm, easily find out if there's more onerous treatment limitations. That needs to be done. And until that's done, you're going to have a bunch of insurance companies counting on the shame and stigma of having these illnesses. And the fact no one's going to appeal their denial because I'm not worthy, I'm, oh yeah, no, my father told me I was a loser, I shouldn't really appeal this denial. 
even though all medicine says it's a brain disorder. So that's what I think we, and, and if we have some Republicans who want to do that, and we get our Democrats saying, hey, this is something, it's a, our, our legacy, we should be proud of it, yeah. let's push for it. Um, I think the combination of the two would be awesome. Democrats and Republicans would both find a political line in this and both would benefit. Thank you. Other questions from our audience, I've, please. So I wonder if you have a comment, you know, the healthcare marketplace is rapidly changing. Um, and both employers and exchanges are moving to high deductible plans. It's a unique situation for mental health providers because many of them do not participate in healthcare plans, insurance plans. So how do you navigate when deductibles look, the cost to patients are going to get higher? A lot of the, their care providers don't participate in their insurance. Seems to, and, and in mental health, there has to be chronic care. It's not at one time and, and you're done. It's not considered a preventive service. So what's going to happen in the future as this continues to evolve and more of a cost to shift to the patient? Um, so in Rhode Island, uh, Craig knows that we have a, a strong prevention pool of money for kids, and the way we fund it is we assess all the insurance companies on a per rata basis of their market share in Rhode Island. Why do they like this program? Because it means they can finally invest in the preventive care that will save them money down the line, but they're loath to pay for because they're not sure whether they're going to end up in their plan later on. But if they know they're at no competitive disadvantage for investing in that pool of money, then all of a sudden they love it because they know in the future those are less people who are going to have uh, these kinds of comorbidities. I think that's a great model. It's an economic model. It's been demonstrated in many states to varying degrees. The, most notable is, you know, for paying for inoculations and pooling some public resources. And it could be done through kind of an initiative like your First Lady is talking about here in the city. Thank you. I have a question from Massachusetts. Um, it's the high school principal. And she said, I'm currently recovering, um, I'm running a recovery high school in Massachusetts and would like to know what kind of policies should be adopted at the state level to advance the kind of work I'm doing in this school. Interesting. Well, my, my wife's a public school teacher, and uh, the only two alternatives for her with a, uh, one of her students acting out is to send them in the nurse's office or, or give them detention. You know, when, when we look at so many of our, our dropouts, we have to understand that they're uh, folks that could have been identified earlier and uh, had interventions earlier that could have made a huge difference in their total dropout rate, which helps all of us. And so all I could say is um, we need to treat kids like we, before they go to school, they check the eyes, the ears for scoliosis, but they don't do that famous checkup from the neck up. And nowhere will it make a bigger difference than a child's ability to learn. If you do that ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Experience score, and find out if they're coming from a home where there's domestic violence, uh, severe poverty, uh, you know, uh, drug addiction and uh, alcoholism that's untreated, mental illness. I mean, you know, we, we, there, there's no mystery that some of these kids have life stories yeah. that put them at high risk for being able to ever learn unless you address their, their situation. And unfortunately, we don't empower our education system to deal with that, but they're never going to learn unless you deal with that. So you need to integrate uh, this early um, kind of warning system for who's going to be high risk and, and put the services behind them um, between the health and the education systems. And you know, critical to that, Congressman, has to be um, this effort to destigmatize because when we label kids the pathway that they go down is often actually I think it re-traumatizes them and so somehow the, there has to be this marriage of this aggressive effort to destigmatize and this effort to um, identify early and treat early thank you other questions from the audience please 
Patrick, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a heroin and prescription opiate epidemic. Uh, overdoses are skyrocketing. Um, thank God we have a lot of some which saving lives. In spite of that, the needle on funding and, and policy changes to make treatment more accessible has barely moved at all. And what I think the stigma may very well be one of the issues that we see this brain disease of addiction very differently than we see other diseases. We think it's a matter of moral weakness, et cetera. And even like in the, under the umbrella of behavioral health, very frequently addiction is sort of the distant stepchild as it relates to funding, et cetera. Can you just kind of comment a little bit on what you think is necessary in order to see the addiction part of the equation more prominently addressed and more effectively addressed. Thanks, John. I, I was uh, disturbed by President Obama's visit in West Virginia. A lot of people think, oh, isn't it great the President's talking about opiate addiction. In the seventh year of his eight-year term, whether you got this kind of epidemic, are you kidding me? And the best that they could come up with is, oh, we're going to restrict supply. We're going to tell more doctors to be wary of how much they prescribe. Has no one from NIH described to the administration that this is a disease and that you're going to substitute one drug for another if you have this disease? The, the type of thing you take is irrelevant if you have this disease? It was shocking to me. And it's shocking to me at the same time we're commercializing the sale of marijuana as a commercial product. Now, the problem with Purdue Pharma is they were producing more Oxycontin than there were people with cancer pain. And the you know, problem with the war on drugs is we were sentencing people for, for their addiction, which absolutely needs to change. But we don't need to go the opposite way, and that's promote a product that, by the way, is going to be advertised in minority neighborhoods just like liquor is at seven, eight times the average rate of advertising in affluent communities. And that, my friends, is the big opportunity blocker for many in this country who will never attain that opportunity because they're sold that this is going to help you feel better with your anxiety and depression. And, and unlike Patrick Kennedy, you're not going to get any you know, great treatment. You'll be lucky if you can scrape by I am, I am offended that this debate on addiction is on supply only and not on treatment, as you said, John, because if it's not coordinated care, then we're letting everyone else off the hook. We're letting all those dentists off the hook, all those plastic surgeons off the hook, we're letting all those other physicians that are writing, and we're letting them off the hook from doing their own screening because they say, oh, well, that's not my business to know if there's anxiety, depression, or propensity for addiction in this patient that I'm dealing with. If you're an obstetrician or a gynecologist and not asking about sexual violence, you're not doing your job. And the notion that we can have a conversation about these issues and not have everyone be part of it, and not have it way down in West Virginia, God bless the folks in West Virginia who got the benefit of having the president speak, but have him speak in, in uh, the Rose Garden and have him say, uh, today I have, you know, Joe Sweetwater from, from uh, Anthem and I have Mark Bertolini from Aetna and both of them want, you know, to have their deals approved because Anthem wants to acquire Cigna and uh, Aetna wants to acquire Humana. Both those deals are worth roughly $50 billion. And they're all going to make a lot of money, but I'm just going to tell them before they cash their checks, those companies better follow the law, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a consent decree that ensures that if they get their market share, and by the way, you're going to have a conglomerate that's going to squeeze out any consumer voice at all with these kinds of Uber mergers between insurance companies. You don't think providers have power now you're going you're gonna to be ruining the day that we let them off the hook on being able to get a merger without guaranteeing that the single greatest epidemic in this country of mental illness and addiction goes untreated because they routinely discriminate. You in New York cannot be the only one suffering discrimination of parity, and yet Schneiderman's the only one that's lodged several major and successful 
lawsuits against payers in the state. What about the rest of the country? No one thinks they have parity violations anywhere else? No, the difference is they don't have an Eric Schneiderman uh, holding those insurance companies accountable. So I just hope, John, I'm giving you a bigger answer than you asked. Right. But I can't not let this opportunity pass mm -hmm. with all the influential people in this room to say what really needs to be said. As sad as it is, I think our time is coming to a close. I would like to just thank a couple of people. These kinds of events don't happen easily, and our engagement team who have been running around and making um, tons of little things happen, I want to thank them. I also want to thank Craig, who brought us Congressman Kennedy. I want to um, honor my colleagues, Christine McMahon, our CEO, Joe Gianetto, our Chief Operating Officer, Karen Wegman, our Chief Financial Officer. And I'd like to close. <laughs> and Marco Donnie for that great plug for my book at the very <laughs> beginning. <laughs> Marco Donahue and all of our board members who came today, thank you so much. You know, um, anyone who was um, alive in 1980 and who watched the Democratic um, Convention may remember this. But you said that um, this quote mattered to you almost as much as ask not what your country can do for you. So I'd like to, <clears throat> I'd like to close with a statement. And I think it's befitting, I mean, it matters to me, obviously I'm getting kind of emotional, but it matters because all of us in this room care about this issue or we wouldn't be here. And your father, Ted Kennedy, closed by saying, for those whose concerns have been our concerns, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>